What's happening, everybody? On today's show, it's breakout time. We're going to give you a list of players that we like. We're going to give you our percentage chance that they break out. Jason's might be a little crazy or great. You'll have to stay tuned to find out. Take your game day treats to the next level with the new M&M's Hazelnut Spread Chocolate Candies. Hazelnut Spread is covered in smooth M&M's milk chocolate, delivering a mouth-watering blend of chocolate and hazelnut in every bite-sized piece. Mm. Mm. Enjoy them on their own or use them to spruce up your favorite desserts. Go hazelnutty and try the new M&M's Hazelnut Spread Chocolate Candies today. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast, coming to you from pristineauction.com studios with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, oh, welcome in. Welcome to the show. It's Tuesday, August 20th. Another great podcast coming your way. We have breakouts. Oh. Now, we're not talking any old ordinary. I mean, we've got our ultimate draft kit, and it's awesome. No, we're talking major. And we've we're got talking. breakouts in the ultimate draft kit. We're, well, we're, you should just define it. The, the ultimate draft kit at least, at least two-thirds, usually all three of us, uh, have to sign off on that player before they get into the ultimate draft kit breakouts on the show is where we're allowed to let that personal bias seep out. Yeah, we're doing our own breakout picks on the show today. Our, yes. Some of our favorite guys. So we got got some breakouts. NFL season's coming quick. Got a good quick question. We're excited. I mentioned it, the Ultimate Draft Kit. If you need help on draft day, we've got an app this year. You can check it all out at ultimatedraftkit.com. A reminder, a dollar of every UDK sold goes directly to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. All the proceeds from this Saturday's live show in Phoenix going straight to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital as well. Been a great partner this year. And we know, look, we know the time of the year. You are consuming all fantasy football content that you can. If you've never been in the Ultimate Draft Kit, this thing is jam-packed. It is bursting. Is there an IV with, in there? Can you hook it up? You might need one after bloodstream? you're done going through all the information. <laughs> okay, just, I'm telling you, you, you log into this thing, and it's it's a research tool. It, this isn't just us saying, well, pick this guy. That's how you win. You want you know how to win? You pick that guy. I mean, we're, we're letting you research, trying to figure some things out for yourself as well. Absolutely. You can follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. The fantasyfootballers.com is the website. Here's the quick question. It comes in from Corey in Hawaii. Oh, bonjour, Corey. Really? So non continental? Yeah, you're I, throwing the non continental bonjour? I can totally get behind that. They're yeah. far enough away. <laughs> bonjour. Mike didn't even think twice. No, I, I don't have to. Look, when, whenever you I see your passport, Mike, you don't when, need your passport to go to Hawaii. Whenever I see the commercials letting me know that good deals are happening, they're like, sorry, Alaska and Hawaii. Oh, so you want to you want to give them that foreign flair? That's right. Okay. Uh, you you also you, you can get the ultimate draft kit for the regular price. <laughs> it's not raised. <laughs> okay. How much do you guys factor in strength of schedule in your fantasy football rankings? Does it play a big role when it comes to fantasy success? What say you? I I do not. Uh, it's something I've learned over the last few years to utilize less and less. I, I try to get more accurate, more predictive strength of schedules, and I do look at that when I go into every team. But over the last several years, I mean, if you're just picking and choosing, you can be like, oh, look, this team did really well, and they had a great early season strength of schedule, but then you're, you're just picking and choosing because what about the teams that did great and had a terrible strength of schedule every year? That's one of those data points that are wrong. So when it comes to the schedule personally, I don't put too much weight on it. Obviously, you know from before the schedule comes out what divisions they're playing against. So you can tell if it's a little bit easier, a little bit more difficult. But I don't factor it in crazy. Where I do factor the schedule is week one defensive pickups. That's like, you know, I look at the early season schedule and think, how is a team going to get off to a, a, an easy start, a, a difficult start? Like I've, I've mentioned, I'm not drafting the Jaguars defense. Great defense. 
They play Kansas City week one. Not Like, I don't want to play them. You're not taking that chance. I don't want to roster two defenses to start. So the Ravens, who are at Miami, the Eagles, home against the Redskins, Seahawks, home against the Bengals, Cowboys, home against the Giants. Those are like, I look at week one to make that determination. I I factor them immensely when you talk about in-season rankings. Preseason draft rankings, I don't because of the fact that many times the players that I draft are not the that's not the team I finished the year with either. So if I'm trying to overemphasize the season schedule, number one, I have to make assumptions about the fact that every defense is going to be the same thing that I think they're going to be, which is never the case. Number two, I'm going to keep those guys throughout the season so that I can utilize them in this dynamic, amazing playoff schedule. So no, when we do in-season projections, that's what defines your week-to-week projection. As you start to see more and more about what these defenses can do, that affects the way your your week to week rankings at the running back, the wide receiver position. Obviously, that plays a big role. I still look at early season though. In in, in the in the UDK, we break down full season, and early season is included in that. And guys like uh, Mark Ingram, he's not really a running back that I've been super interested in this off season. I, I feel just okay taking him, but they have a great schedule to open things up so maybe when I'm in those rounds where I'm, I'm looking at guys like Mark Ingram I'm going to use that as a tiebreaker to know that Ingram should get off to a, a pretty nice start so you play against Miami then right the Cardinals yeah the Kansas City Chiefs yeah so I I do look at the early ones it's people want their fantasy playoff rankings strength of schedule right now that part is going to be so different well, and, and and to your point, I don't mind you looking at them. I think that's why we break it down like that in the UDK. We talked about streaming quarterbacks on the ranking show all the time. You don't want to – same same logic behind the defense. You don't want to go grab a quarterback that's got terrible perceived matchups. But even you looking at that, even what you believe about Ingram's schedule, could be wrong. Because right. yeah, the, of, the, of the defensive turnover and the expectations. So, I mean, we saw that last year. Certain games you expected – amazing top of the season and it didn't happen for some players so um you just gotta those first six weeks of the nfl you're starting to learn about what defenses are what yeah uh, the people ask you know what's a is there anything any time of the year where it's harder to rank week two setting projections for players is extremely difficult you might think well week one no it's week two when you have that week one data, which is a nothing. That is a nothing sample size, and it starts infecting your brain. I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to draw a conclusion that this team is washed based off of the of the opening schedule. Yeah, it's a good point. It's a good point. We're going to get right into it today. No news segment on the show. We do want to give a shout out to Sleeper. Check out the Sleeper app. Let's get into the breakouts. Breakouts. All right. We get to bring a couple names each to the table here today. Players that we're excited about. Players that... Um, there's a wide range of conviction when it comes to a breakout, right? Everybody throws this word around all the time. And you kind of have the... You know, the way Twitter is and with social media and... It's hard to fly under the radar and be a breakout. With the coverage that fantasy gets now, yes. So I think it's more important than to kind of qualify our breakouts more by our percentage of certainty. How strong do we believe in it? Because let's let's face it, there are a lot of players that could break out. Maybe they got a 10% chance or a 20% chance. But I, you know... How sure are you when, sure. you when you talk about your guys, talk about how positive you are that these players are going to have that breakout season. And, and it's not – all breakouts are not created equal. A guy that, uh, that we like, you could say, oh, he's going to break out. But that just means now he's going from absolute nothingness where you've never even heard of this player's name to now they're, now they're a wide receiver three. They're not burning down the house with fantasy points, but they are usable on a week-to-week basis. That's how I look at – uh, a breakout is someone who had no value and now almost weekly that this person has value. I think it's fair, and I think a lot of the times it also represents a tier jump. You know, does the yeah. player, sure. does a player move into a tier that we'll be talking about them completely different in 2020? 
Yeah, when and I'm I I'll, I'll kick us off here because I am pretty darn confident and bullish on this player. I think the breakout is as likely as it was for me and my acne in high school. Oh, we're, we're talking complete breakout. Oh, gross. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome, everybody. Uh, were you a, were you a full face? Oh yeah, full face back. Sorry, my former uh, colleagues, friends, family. <laughs> um. No. Present, but you Pre pulled, present you pulled company through. excluded. We, we pulled through. We pulled through. We Good got for here. you. Super handsome now. Uh, for those uh, just yeah. listening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, I early in the off season, I talked totally. about. <laughs> thanks, guys. I talked about Chris Godwin a lot in the early off season because I really, really believe in both the talent and the situation. When you bring those things together, I think you tear jump. I think you become a very uh, reliable player, but we haven't really brought his name up that much in the last month or so. Um, obviously, uh, around we left that to everybody else, right? I was going to say around the community, plenty of buzz around Chris Godwin, but he's someone that I personally believe is a is a great wide receiver. So coming out of college, Matt Harmon said he was basically the best contested catch player he had ever tracked. Um, in the UDK this year, Matt Harmon's reception perception says he's the easiest breakout to spot. From a distance, he literally on every single route, he is above the NFL average by a wide margin with the exception of one route. He's a tactician. He's got a great, uh, you know, ability to grab the contested catches. And if you look at, he's entering his year three, right? Last year, he became relevant. He was the wide receiver 25, of a top-end wide receiver three. And that was while you had Adam Humphreys, and Deshaun Jackson taking a bunch of targets away. Now, those two guys are gone. He's going to go way up in targets, and you have the addition of Bruce Arians installing his offense where we know from a large sample of history that the slot guy for Bruce Arians is great. Obviously, it was great for Larry Fitzgerald. Larry Fitzgerald had a five-year stretch with him where he was averaging 137 targets, 92 receptions, 1,000 yards, and seven touchdowns. That's great. But it wasn't just there, and it was, you know, first ballot Hall of Famer Larry Fitzgerald where he was the one. Look back to when he was with the Steelers and Bruce Arians had Heinz Ward who was dominating in that area. Same, same kind of numbers, 130 target pace. From 2008 and 2009, 88 receptions, 1,100 yards, six and a half touchdowns, and that was on a team where he. Did you just name another Hall of Famer as your example for the I other Hall of believe, Famer? I don't believe Heinz Ward is a Hall of Famer. He's I, not already in, is he? I I thought Heinz Ward is was Hall, uh, on Heinz, his way. Well, I I certainly did not name another first ballot Hall of Famer. All right. And who's to say Chris Godwin is not a future Hall of Famer? And he may be. Maybe that's he the did, truth. He did. Last year, Heinz Ward missed the Hall of Fame cut for three straight years. So. There you go. Um, the but he wasn't I the one. Corrected. Yeah, but was Chris Godwin in Batman? Heinz Ward was in Batman. I did not. I did not you, know that. Ah. <laughs> okay. So sorry. Uh, thanks, we, Mike. We have derailed Jason. Uh, but but back then, you still had Santonio San Holmes, who was you know in 2009 had more targets because a lot of you know it's like well you got Mike Evans, you still had. Uh, Heath Miller with 100 targets. And the slot role was valuable. So I think it's the combination, right? You've got the talent of Chris Godwin, who's excellent. The camp buzz has been electric. Every highlight from him in camp and in preseason has been dominant. You've got the role. You've got the vacated targets. It's just kind of this, this whole picture where I think he's going to become a very relevant weekly player. And I think that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers – are going to be seen similar to what how we view the Minnesota Vikings, right? You got Thielen, you got Diggs, you got Kyle Rudolph, and they're not a pass first team. But this is a pass first team that's got basically, you know, you've got Evans and Godwin and OJ Howard, and I think all three are going to be very fantasy relevant players this year. Jameis, uh, for do they still have Jameis? Yes, so that, that was a joke. I four know snaps, four snaps where Jameis Winston was playing, so twenty two snaps. This is from Adam Leviton. Chris Godwin has been on the field for all 22, and he's been in the slot for eight of them. So yeah. they, they're, he's, gonna, he's a full-time player, which we already knew that, but they are moving him around, and they're putting him in the slot. Yeah, I think, I think the only difference between some of the examples that you gave is a player with a history of success in the NFL uh, from a fantasy perspective or a career perspective. I think Godwin can do it. 
I think you saw the ups and downs of being with Jameis Winston last year. I mean, he if you look at the consistency chart for Godwin as a 22-year-old, um, you know, you, you might not want to look too much because he had some rough weeks. But, of course, I think he's going to – he was a fringe kind of uh, player that you were willing to put in the lineup last year. Everybody's been on um, the bandwagon this offseason. So then it's just an ADP situation from a fantasy owner perspective. But that – that doesn't preclude him from breaking out, even if he's too expensive right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think his floor is is very high now. And so where he's at in ADP, I'm fine taking him there because I think he's going to be a... So you are, you're fine taking him at his current yes. average draft position. 100%. Hmm. All right. Yeah. Um, 408 right now. So you have to choose between Robert Woods and Chris well, Godwin in every draft that you're in. Which no, one do you choose? because I, I don't ever choose between Robert Woods and anybody else. Godwin or Galladay? Godwin. Godwin or Lockett, another friend, oh. friend of yours. Lockett was almost my breakout, but I feel like he's already broke out. I love Lockett. He really does. Man. I really do. I'm, I'm so rising. It's very strange what has happened here. I'm, I'm telling you guys, Lockett's in for a huge season this year. Breakout 2.B. 2.B. Okay. Mike, why don't you take the reins? All right, I'm going to jump in. Uh, we've talked about him a little bit more and more over these past weeks. I really think he's going to break out, and that is wide receiver from the Jacksonville Jaguars, D.D. Westbrook. Uh, look, Nick Foles, he is now the quarterback for the Jaguars, and Nick Foles has targeted players lined up in the slot at the sixth highest rate over the last two seasons. Blake Bortles, not so much. The, the, the slot is not his favorite wide receiver. Uh, last year in five stars, Nick Foles completed over 72% of his passes. He was fantastic. Blake Bortles was at his career best at 60.3. D.D. Westbrook still managed to be a wide receiver 33 in half-point PPR. He had 101 targets. There's only 28 players last year that saw 100 or more targets. And you want to talk about vacated targets? Jacksonville, the third most, over 50%. Moncrief and his 89 targets are gone. T.J. Yeldon and his 78 targets, they are gone. Jacksonville did not make a big splash addition. You got Chris Conley. He's a fine player, yeah, okay. but but that's not the the Raiders going out and saying, we have a problem. We're bringing in Antonio Brown. And they added in pass-happy coordinator D. Filippo as their OC. He had great red zone usage. His his red zone target percentage is just in, is in line with Stephon Diggs. So here's what I see. Here's the three-bullet, three-pronged approach. For D.D. Westbrook. There's bullets. There's prongs. This is like, all sorts of things in threes to support this argument. Now that I'm looking at it, maybe it's four, but maybe whatever. Maybe it's three. Look, there will be – there's the natural rise of targets for the third-year player because of the vacated targets. He will get increase in usage just from the natural tendency of his quarterback. He will see an increase of catchable targets just because of better quarterback play. And then there's the possibility of targets going up because they brought in a pass happy OC. There, there are for a lot of breakout players, you're looking at one or two stabilizing forces. Like these are the two reasons I'm buying into this player. D. Westbrook for me has has so many things in his favor. Who do you have more confidence in? Yeah, to get the ball to their slot receiver, Jameis Winston or Nick Foles? Honestly. Uh, Nick Foles. Nick Foles? Yeah. It's in, both players. I mean, there, it's compelling arguments for both players because they're very similar. Last year, sure. last year, total fantasy points, they were almost the exact same. Chris Godwin and D.D. Westbrook. People don't realize that there is a four-round difference right now in Godwin, and I, I think it comes a little bit with the high-flying yes. uh, ceiling we've seen from Winston and then Arians. and Tampa Bay will have a better offense right. overall. Right. I'm, I'm not saying that. And, but right and now, this, Didi's in the eighth round, oh, whereas um, maybe not anymore. But <laughs> Whatever. But yeah. And this is not – I'm calling for Didi to break out to be a top-12 guy. But I think Didi Westbrook can easily find himself into the top 24 if, if he's getting the same uh, target market share uh, or if the increased market share because Nick Foles is there. D.D. Westbrook is going to be an excellent PPR guy. All right, my breakout. It's actually our breakout. I think we threw him into the UDK over the last month. Miles Sanders, running back for the Philadelphia Eagles. I'm in love with the draft price. I'm in love with the player. When we went through all of these different uh, dynasty rookie drafts over the last you know, three or four months ago, 
it was that tough decision. Okay, Jacobs, yes. Jacobs was going ahead of both these guys. And then do you go David Montgomery, who has a great opportunity there in Chicago? Or do you go with Miles Sanders? And it didn't feel great going with Miles Sanders in the beginning. Banged up, injured, Jordan Howard's there. They bring back Sproles. They bring back, you know, they have this plethora of, of running backs. But now, you know, you look at the draft costs between Miles Sanders and David Montgomery. You look at what you think the offense is going to be. Yes, we can, we can be big naggy fans in Chicago. Their offense wasn't that good, right? It wasn't, it wasn't an upper echelon offense compared to what Philadelphia has shown and is capable of being. So I think the offense is better in Philly. So the question then is, hey, will Miles Sanders be given enough work to justify drafting him, playing him? Is he a startable RB2? Since Chip Kelly jettisoned LaShawn McCoy after the 2014 season, the Eagles... Going back to Chip. Yeah, the Eagles have had a different leading rusher every single season since. DeMarco Murray... Ryan Matthews, LeGarrette Blunt, Josh Adams. Oh, Ryan Matthews. <laughs> but I miss you. I know. Yeah, oh, yes. But but Miles Sanders is the highest draft capital pick the Eagles have had since LaShawn McCoy. This is a second round pick with a three down skill set. So you look at a few things in the preseason. I say don't look at stat lines, right? You look at what the player does. And to me, he's checking every box. Here's here's box one. Jason, you said uh step one on any uh yesterday on the show. Number one thing that can happen to a running back in the preseason is not play. Yes, that's best case. Assuming you're at the top of the depth chart. Next best case is to get the first snap. Well, Miles Sanders got the first snaps ahead of Jordan Howard in preseason week two. Did a lot with them. He also, if you watch the film, showed that he could pick up the blitz. He had a couple of great blitz pickups, something that they're concerned about to get him on the field to be a three-down type of guy. Great vision, great ability to change direction in the open field. More explosive than any other back that they have on their roster. Um, it is a guy who ran a four four nine. If you watch the uh, combine video of him and Saquon, he's got Saquon beat for the first uh, third of that forty times. So what about the two thirds? Yeah, that was Saquon. <laughs> but four four nine. Okay, so you're not talking about a huge gap. You you could have gone with the fact that that Miles Sanders had more rushing yards before entering the draft than the, in his final at season State, than Barkley at the same exact position. This is just a really, really good player. Well, And, and, and the, really, really good rookie running backs do things in fantasy. That's second, what I was going to say. Second round pick in the NFL draft. You know, the last seven years, on average, there's about two and a quarter of the of two and a quarter out of the top twelve running backs are rookies every single year at the running back position. Miles Sanders is a perfect shot to take a perfect guy to take the shot on because he doesn't cost too much. And he's in the situation where he could absolutely emerge. I, I really like the pick of Miles Sanders. And you th and you think about the player he, players he's around, Eckler, Cohen, Miller. You're talking about a different ceiling than right. Miles Sanders. Before we get to our next set of players, want to thank today's sponsor, NFL Game Pass. Only with the NFL Game Pass do you get every out-of-market preseason game live. Can the Browns show early signs of being a playoff contender? Do the Cowboys have all the pieces in place? Go watch Miles Sanders pick up a blitz. <laughs> to make a run in the NFC. Watch Miles Sanders pick up a blitz. I will, We are in the NFL Game Pass every single day right now. We're going yes. into preseason. We're using that condensed, uh, the, the condensed version of the games. It's incredible. You take in an entire football game in about 30 to 45 minutes, or yeah, 30 to 45 minutes, you can watch whatever you need to watch being, right now. Being able to push a left arrow key and just watch a play over and over and over is so great. It's the, the Game Pass, it's a great product, it's, and it's awesome being able to watch every single preseason game. Make sure to see all the action this preseason with NFL Game Pass. You can kick off the 2019 NFL season with a seven-day free trial when you sign up now at NFL.com slash footballers. That's NFL.com slash fantasy footballers. Make sure you get in on it before preseason week three is upon us. And we want to thank ADT, a proud sponsor of the fantasy footballers. Real protection from ADT is personalized smart home security with a system that fits your unique needs. They are the latest in innovation in smart home security from ADT. Everything from HD video doorbells, high def indoor and outdoor cameras, smart locks and lights, even the smart thermostats, all controlled 
by the ADT app or the sound of your voice. But real protection doesn't stop there. You can take ADT peace of mind with you on the go with the ADT Go app. That features location sharing, safe driving reports, and an emergency SOS button. Real Protection is a team of professionals who help safeguard your home with rapid connection to first responders 24-7. That's how ADT, the nation's number one smart home security provider, helps keep your home and your family safe wherever you go. Real Protection with ADT. To learn more, visit ADT.com slash podcast. All right, we've got another breakout. Each of us has another breakout for you. Um, who, who's going? It's Jason's Jason, turn. Jason's oh, turn. I'm up. Look, this guy is It's a little dicey, right? And, and by it's, I mean hamstrings. Hamstrings are a little dicey here. But I am willing to still say that I believe that there will be a breakout from Aaron Jones. If I have to put my money on whether or not he's going to uh, have a great season and be a valuable fantasy asset or whether he's going to – flame out and be in a timeshare that doesn't work and not get the job and disappoint people at his ADP, I'm definitely taking the Aaron Jones side. When I'm on the clock at his ADP, it is very difficult to pass a guy who could be a top five, top ten fantasy back. This is where if he does break out, it's not just a, oh, you get to you get to play him every now and then. You get to have him be a regular, you know, uh, contributor to your fantasy team. This is a guy who could help win you a title. Aaron Jones, running back for the Green Bay Packers, you could argue he already broke out, right? Because if you look at last year, a little bit, he got he got like a an arm and a leg through. Right. I'm picturing Jurassic Park. Yes, the <laughs> vel Velociraptor coming out of the egg. Exactly. Yes. Exactly what I meant. Thank you guys. It's kind of a Velociraptor on the field. Yeah, That's I mean. What this colleagues have said so he missed the first couple weeks last year this is a little history lesson here um he missed the first couple weeks and then he got in uh, about week three but he didn't really take the starting job over until week seven from that point thanks mike mccarthy yeah i know it was ridiculous but from that point forward from week seven until he was out the end of the year which is seven games he was the running back 10 he was a he was an rb1 during that stretch and that was for the team with the fewest carries in the National Football League, the Green Bay Packers, with the absolute lowest total in their history of their storied franchise at, at running the ball, he is an unbelievably effective, efficient, talented running back. He averaged 5.5 .5 yards per carry last year, which is probably unsustainable, despite the fact that his rookie year he also averaged 5.5 .5 yards a carry. He's great in the passing game, and that's something they want to – get him more involved with. So we've seen it on the field already that Aaron Jones is electric. He's great. He's been a top 10 running back for a, a stretch of seven weeks. But now you enter in Matt LaFleur, the new head coach coming over from Tennessee. The last two years, he's been in charge of two different offenses. Both offenses were top 10 in rushing attempts, top 10 in rushing yards. And so now it's like, oh, if you just take – I went back and I looked at every single box score – uh, the whole year that Aaron Jones was in there, whether he was a starter, whether he wasn't. And I looked at how did that break down on the carries? Were they giving him the ball? Were they giving it to Jamal Williams? Was Aaron Rodgers rushing the ball? If he got the exact same rate that everybody was upset with last year, and you, 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 tell, them, you tell me that they're going to finish as the 16th most rushing attempts, you just take the number from last year, that would be 224 carries that would end up going specifically to Aaron Jones. He is an Alvin Kamara type of player. He's not getting 224 carries. No, but my point is that would just be his already his workload last year, that percentage of uh, market share in that backfield. If they weren't dead last in the NFL in rushing attempts and they were just 16th in the NFL, I'm saying that that would, that would be 225 rushing attempts. And if you gave him that kind of volume, he, he would be a breakout. That, you know, Alvin Kamara has never had 200 rushing attempts, and he's that type of a player. Plus, a lot of the story from preseason training camp was wanting to get him involved in the passing game. Uh, we, we talk about it a lot in fantasy. Uh, a pass, a target is worth a whole lot more than a rushing attempt. So you've got the talent. You've got the quarterback. You've got the team. You've got a head coach coming in that wants to run the ball more. If his hamstrings were fine, I think you'd you'd be seeing him at the like 2-3 turn in fantasy – well, I, I think the question marks is that it's not necessarily an asset to repeat the fact that they were dead last in rushing because Aaron Rodgers' team, this is why, I mean, Aaron Jones was written on my board as one of my, my guys for about four months on the, on the board. I got a little hesitant. 
Now, it's a strong counterpoint to say, hey, when Matt LaFleur has been involved in an offense, they generally are in that upper echelon of, of rushing attempts. But you still have to hope that that team gets there. It's not like imbuing you know, the Seahawks and they're, what they've already proven. Yeah, I mean, they have to go do it. Derrick Henry was only – he had 215 attempts last year. Like it is, you, he's been there. He, he was on the Tennessee Titans, the, the OC, for, for two years, and they were split backfields the entire time. That's, right. My confidence is like lower on Jones than it was. I love the talent, but if, if push comes to shove, I know for a fact Aaron Rodgers will throw the football. That's, that's, he will take over the team, and so that gave me a little bit of pause about declaring a breakup, but I want to have some fun with this. Let's go back through the first guys. I want to get a percentage chance of that – Percentage chance that they give you a season that fantasy owners will look at and say, that was a breakout season, and then I'll let you do that with Aaron Jones too. But Godwin, what percentage chance do you think that fantasy owners will look back after the year and say, Chris Godwin was a breakout? I'm going to say a 66% chance. Okay, two-thirds. Mike, you, you brought up the name D.D. Westbrook. What percentage chance do you I want was, to attribute? I was going to say 65. <laughs> Much different. Much different. I'm more confident than you, Mike. Um, my you first are, one was my, Miles mine's Sanders. Mine's less expensive if, if I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm about 75% with Miles Sanders. Oof. Oof. Spicy. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was going to end up low because I thought you guys were more confident in your picks, but whatever. I'm just um, I'm just leaving margin for error, my I, man. That's And that's that's your prerogative. Aaron Jones, Jason, based on what you're saying, and I we've all seen the talent, what is your confidence level in Aaron Jones having a breakout season it is it is more than 50 percent it is less than 60 percent I would go ahead and say <laughs> oh. see that's a proper Brooks how you doing excellent okay that was a proper he gave me the time to find the button that's he didn't just move. throw like the Josh Stallion thing out there and then I'm scrambling I, I just want you to learn I do what I can okay um all right, so anything you want to add to Aaron Jones? I, I know that um, we both shed a little bit of doubt on there. You, you have Well, you, the only thing I would add as a counterpoint to your argument about, you know, them them not running the ball. They've they've always Green Bay with Aaron Rodgers has always been uh, fine at running the ball. Last year was this weird aberration where they just decided I'm, we're not going to run the ball at all. We're going to throw it all the, all the time. There were games last year where I was, I was tracking this data. Let me see if I can uh, find it real quick. Where I think they had like eleven or thirteen carries, whole game. Like they just didn't. That, yeah, that's that, That's what freaks me out. But that was that, yeah, that was, was different regime. If, if that's a, in the realm of possibilities for a it for a team, be, it just it gives you less confidence in consistency. Maybe the breakout games are there, but wouldn't that make you? No. I mean, that's never going to happen in Seattle, ever. But, yeah, if, but if the, McCarthy were the coach, then then you could bring that up and sure, say, this. I'm sure. concerned about the this. The time at which something like that happens, yeah, 13 carries in a game. That's yeah, those, those, those are so incredibly rare for an NFL franchise that a guy coming in who's been top 10 in Russian contempt the last two years, I can't fathom him going, yeah, we're going to do the same thing. All right, Mike, who's your next breakout? All and right. Give me your percentage. I will give you my percentage. Yeah, uh, look, well, whatever. We'll just start with the percentage. It's 85%. Whoo. Because I'm taking Vance McDonald. It's... <laughs> oh, it's happening, people. We are going to be doing the Vance dance. ADP be darned. This thing is happening. You th you struggle with this. I did. In the, in the studio, you're just like, eventually you wrote the name down. Because the average job position, has, it's been a... It's been bothering you. Yes. It's been troubling. It's made you not want to lean in, not get behind it all the way, even though you know in the deep parts of your soul. It doesn't matter. This is happening. Vance McDonald is finally breaking out. The Pittsburgh Steelers have lost over 35% of their targets between Antonio Brown and the largest competition, just positionally speaking, tight end Jesse James. He is no longer there. Yes. People, we want to point out the Pittsburgh Steelers probably have some regression coming to their passing attempts. Ben is not going to throw the ball 675 times. I agree. In 2017, Big Ben was on a pace for 598 attempts. The year before that, 582. The year before that, 625. They're still going to throw the ball a ton, even if it's not at 675 times. Pittsburgh has been incredibly patient. More patient than I could imagine with Vance McDonald when they traded for him. He, his contract was bloated. That's why San Francisco wanted to get rid of him. His injury history. But they have sat and they have waited. We have seen. We have already seen Vance McDonald take over a game for the Pittsburgh Steelers 
in the highest possible time. A playoff game against Jacksonville two years ago, 16 targets, 10 receptions, 112 yards. 16 targets. Yes, and yeah, that, it's just one game. I get it, but my point is we've seen him take over a game. Heath Miller, when, when Big Ben actually had a pass-catching tight end, it was Heath Miller. This was a while ago. He regularly saw excellent target shares, including Jason. Yeah. Funny enough, the year you brought up when the, all three of them had over 100 targets, Antonio Brown, Mike Wallace, and Heath Miller. You realize Jesse James started last year with the – week one he was the number eight tight end, week two he was the number two tight end? Yes. Look, because Big Ben utilizes the tight end position, and now that position belongs to Vance McDonald. Over the last two years, only Travis Kelsey – has more broken tackles at the position. Travis Kelsey's a full-time tight end. Vance McDonald has not been. Over the last two years, only George Kittle has a better yards after catch. Last year, 12th most receptions at the tight end, 11th most yards at the tight end position. He was the tight end 10 in half-point PPR scoring as a part-time player. What do I mean, Andy, by a part-time player? He averaged 55% of the snaps. 55! Oh! It didn't look That's like not he, enough. It, right. Tight but tight end ten with fifty five percent of the of the snaps. He's not playing no fifty five percent of Pittsburgh snaps at the position this year. Can he stay healthy? Ah, maybe. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> like everyone can get hurt. That's the fifteen percent sure. off the eighty five. If he's playing, he's going to break out. It's going to happen. All right, eighty five percent. That's our highest thus far. I'm a, I'm at about eighty percent. On my pick. So I think Vance wins the day in terms of certainty factor. And it's Curtis Samuel. You've heard a lot about Curtis mm. Samuel. Um, it all comes down to one thing for Curtis Samuel this season, which is to stay healthy. He's 23 years old. He's poised to make the leap. He's the talk of camp. He's an athletic freak that had transitioned from being kind of a running back hybrid guy into the wide receiver position. But he missed 10 games through the first two seasons due to injury. So his health is the key to him actually paying off for you. But right now what I love about Curtis Samuel, in part for the fantasy side, is you got to pay two more rounds to get DJ Moore. And I think much like, you know, we've talked a little bit about Galladay and Marvin Jones and like the, the round gap is so significant between the two that there's going to be Jones weeks. And I don't dislike DJ Moore at all. I think DJ Moore has a great ceiling in the offense as well. But you have a you have a healthy Cam Newton, and his main targets are going to be DJ Moore and Curtis Samuel in this offense, along with Christian McCaffrey, obviously. So you look at where does Curtis Samuel win on the football field? And this is apart from the preseason hype. This is apart from him being arguably the best player in camp. He wins at every single level, in every single route. If you look at reception perception, 74.6% success rate against man coverage. That's the 94th percentile. He's a player that you can get the ball to him downfield. You can get it to him in the screen game, and he can uh, you know, joystick his way through the defense. And uh, he converted 73% of his contested catches as well. I just think what you're paying for Curtis Samuel in the seventh round is going to more than return the value on Curtis Samuel the, in 2019. This has been the offseason of Curtis Samuel. He, he, I think it really has been. He's won. I don't think any player from front to back, from the very beginning to, to right now, has had more buzz and more just people going goo-goo bananas over his performance in camp, performance on the field. He's, he's just been out, outstanding. It is sad that he's all of a sudden – I mean, we were looking at ADP the other day – and, you know, I'm still a believer that Dante Pettis can break out. And Curtis Samuel was going ahead of Dante Pettis now in these drafts. He has skyrocketed because for the longest time, he was still 13th round, 12th round. Then he got buzzed. Then it was like 10th round. Now he's up to the 7th. I, 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 I just hope it slows down. Thanks to you, Andy. Probably it won't. might not. Probably well, won't. I will add this in. People who are in the, in the realm, we're all consuming – this content right now you're listening to this podcast you know who curtis samuel is you may have to pay that adp i'm telling you in the the majority of like home leagues casual leagues which a lot of our listeners play in you're gonna get him really really late we just did a uh draft the celebrity draft we did with with juju and ninja and pals we got curtis samuel super late they were all sleeping on curtis samuel still so 
I think there is still the there's still this world that exists where guys like Curtis Samuel, the the majority of your league won't know who he is. He didn't play at the beginning of last year. And honestly, for fantasy awareness, that front half of the year matters a lot more than the back half for a lot of like uh, fantasy owners to come around on who the player is. I mean, over right. the back half, he had a handful of these weeks where you know he was a one, wide receiver, two, three, fringe guy. Um, he had a top 10 week against Tampa. But that first half, I mean, he was nowhere. Nobody knows who you are. So he hasn't really – and he's so young. So he hasn't had the opportunity to kind of get in the limelight for, like you said, for home leagues or for people that – uh, DJ Moore, the draft capital, more recently drafted high in, yep. in the draft. So I think he's just going to be a very interesting guy, and I think they're going to involve him heavily in the offense now that he's healthy. So uh, I've got him at about 80%. I don't, I don't think there's a way a healthy Curtis Samuel isn't um, paying out, even the, the seventh round. If he keeps climbing up, you know, I still take the cheaper of the two if you believe Cam Newton is going to be back and healthy and doing what right. he does. I do. All right, that is it for breakouts today. You guys, uh, you want to jump in the mailbag? Sure. Mailbag. Mailbag. Woo! All right, if you have a question for the fantasy footballers, you can click the submit a question button on the website. You can dial the voicemail hotline, 302-464-TFFB. Our first question, Mike, you're say, pointing at me. Well, I, I loved Jason's breakout he he referenced the acne mm -hmm. i was like there's there's a movie i know there's a movie you're thinking and, of outbreak it, well there's either it's a seems like it would be a common name but the only thing i could really find was the smash hit from 2013 breakout starring brendan frazier you guys remember that i remember oh, when yeah. he broke out with the mummy yeah what he broke out with i guess encino, encino man, man. Yeah. no no you're you. right you're right he broke out in my life with the mummy that's fine I'm just saying. And then he, then what is it? What is the opposite of a breakout? Uh, breakdown? Disappearing. A breakdown? A uh, Houdini? Yeah. Well, he, he's he's not exactly in the limelight anymore. Yeah, not really. He's making I still, a comeback. I still love him. All right, Matt in Chicago. Hey, ballers, would you ever pass up a player in an earlier round because you are target, targeting his teammates in a later round and don't want the stack? What perfect timing on that question. Would you pass on DJ Moore in the fifth because you want to grab Curtis Samuel in the seventh round? And I would. Yeah, there are certain players that I find myself, uh, the more mocks I do, you know, another uh, example would be maybe I don't take Kenny Galladay earlier when, when maybe he is in consideration because I often get Marvin Jones later in a draft. If there is a player that I like targeting late because of the nebulous situation of his team, I don't usually pay for the earlier one. But you also have to do that draft soul searching inside where if you miss out on both of these players now, is that okay? Or are you – you're locked in. I got to have a piece of this offense. Because if, if you bypass the early one, there's no guarantee unless you massively reach for the second player. Yeah, yeah. I, it's an interesting question, and it varies quite a bit with, you know, are these guys a round or two apart, or are you talking about, you know, a, a, a round three guy or a round nine guy? or something of that nature. All right, voicemail question. Hey, ballers, this is Kyle in New Jersey. I have a commissioner question. We're going to start doing keepers in my league starting 2020. Just wanted to know your thoughts on the best way to determine keeper costs in the draft and how to handle players that are taken off waivers during the season. Mm -hmm. Love the show, guys. Thanks a lot. Hotly debated topic from time to time here on the show. Answer, Passionate. Answer number one is... There's no right way to do it. I mean, we, we have a league that there is no cost. You just pick three keepers, but you can't keep the same position. I mean, we people do it differently in each and every league. I know that Jason has strong feelings about not allowing – like some leagues do waiver wire guys oh. in, for the last oh. round pick. Don't do that. Yeah, that's – I. you know, a lot of times you'll you'll do something where you – you establish your keepers. You can keep them at whatever you drafted them, and and every year or two it goes up two rounds or something like that. If you got them off the waivers, then it's your last round pick. That was like the default several years ago when keeper systems were were just being made. So it was really common. And then you know after 2014, Odell Beckham Jr., who was a waiver wire guy, who was a top you know five pick the next season, was just completely free, even though. Nobody in your league and then it was drafted David, him. Then it was David Johnson. Yeah, so to me, I love – I personally love the the 
forced strategy on a league where it's like if you don't draft the player, if the league doesn't draft them so that they cannot be kept, they're just not eligible to be kept. They back in the draft. Um, Andy doesn't like that. I love that. Like that is my I mean, preferred it, method. So what, you don't get, so you don't get rewarded for being a an, in a keeper league. You can't pick up a guy and so have what's a the reward. cost then. I think you can do it a number of ways. You can do it uh, two rounds behind ADP, one round behind ADP. Uh, how about this? Inventing it on the spot. What if what you paid in fab for him, you got to give up if you want to keep him. You get a, you give up your last round pick plus the fab you spent on that player if it's a free agent pickup. Here's the thing. If a player isn't of any cost, people trade keepers. So that, that guy has a different value, right? You can go trade for David Johnson, and he has no cost, so he's got a different elevated value. It just depends on how you want to play. I can't imagine just telling people the more fun way to play fantasy football is if you pick a guy off of waivers. In our keeper league, you can't keep him. No, it's not. It, it, I don't think it takes any fun away because it's not like you don't get a keeper now. You've got to keep the guys that you drafted or that were drafted. I mean, the, the reality is – You never had is, a badge of honor, though, where you have a guy oh, that I you love, picked up yes. off of waivers. You're like, man, I saw that Philip Lindsay before anybody else. I saw George Kittle before anybody else. And that's why I drafted him is what I would say. No, you didn't draft him. You waiver picked no, him I up. know, but then it's uh, – we're talking about draft cost, right? So, like – the, you're rewarding. I think that the point of the 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 for the where you draft for the draft cost, the point is rewarding the owners who found those guys in your draft late and made the decision to spend the draft equity on that guy. I got Curtis Samuel in the thirteenth in an early you know off season draft, and you're rewarding their insight at the draft. I didn't think keepers was about the draft only. I thought it was about the yeah. league. I, 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 <laughs> I side more with Andy on the, the philosophy of you got to find a way to be able to, to let players keep them. And it's, it's ADP minus a round for me. I think you're, that's a, that's a you're fine rewarded. Compromise. You, you get someone's like David Johnson or, or James Conner this past year. You picked them up off of waivers, right? And, the, and this wasn't even after week. Nice one. move, Mike. Yeah, I know. Well, Picking him up. Look, and he you shouldn't be allowed to keep James Conner for free. Should be ADP minus a round. So you'd get him for a second round. Second round pick. All right. Parker in North Phoenix. Why is no one even drafting Tony Pollard anywhere? Comparatively, shouldn't he be getting drafted somewhere behind or between Austin Eckler and Justin Jackson? I'm aware they're not in the same offensive systems, and Eckler has standalone value, but doesn't Pollard deserve to at least be drafted? And if so, where? We haven't talked a lot about to Tony. We, we talked Pollard. about him on yesterday's mock draft show at, at the very end, and and yes, I I believe he should be drafted very very late. You'll find out soon. You'll you'll know before week one if Zeke is going to come back. The difference between the Cowboys and the Chargers, I think nationally, and just talk to fantasy people, Melvin Gordon's uh, his holdout threats are real. I don't believe Zeke is actually going to hold out. I think he will be back before week one. Melvin Gordon, though, I believe will take it to the limit and he'll sit out as many games as as he thinks he can get away with without having to toll his contract over. I, That's the difference. You don't believe that Zeke will do that? I don't. I believe it's possible. I believe it's, it's, I think it's possible that Zeke takes then, wh it. then why aren't you drafting Tony Pollard? I didn't say not to. Oh. I didn't say anything about it yet, but I think I think Tony Pollard is a little bit. Uh, I think the team likes him. I don't think he can handle the full workload. He, but he doesn't have to. He no. just has to handle the couple weeks yeah, that Zeke I, is gone. I've, I've drafted Tony Pollard in best ball leagues the same All way right. I'm drafting Darwin Thompson. But um, I do. I'm just saying. I think Zeke. Zeke believes that Zeke is the be all end all for that team, and. Now you've got back and forth between Jerry Jones and Ezekiel Elliott about the little quip about Zeke who. And look, you get too contentious. Pride is a powerful thing. That's We've true. seen things go That's from true. logic. Logic says you can't hold out. Your contract says this. Pride says something else. That that uh, quip, uh, as, as you call it, the, the, where Jerry Jones was like, Zeke who, and then Zeke's camp said that they were offended by that and all that. What it reminded me of in, in a little bit of a scary way was when the Bleacher Report article came out last year from inside the Pittsburgh Steelers locker room where the players were saying, hey, where is Lev Bell? I don't like that he's not here. We're fine with James Conner. And Lev Bell took that to heart. And he was like, 
th- that's when everything flipped, and that's exactly what you're talking about, Andy. It takes it from logic to pride, and so, yeah, it, it's scary. But to answer the listener's question as to why are they gapped, it's because right now the expectation is that Gordon will miss more games than Zeke. Tony Pollard looked great in preseason week two. I will say that. A couple impressive runs. Um Cole in Wisconsin. Hey, fellas, love the show. Is there a remedy or punishment for people who take way too long to respond to trade proposals or at times even let the trade expire? Yeah, I don't think Some, there's a remedy. <laughs> different strokes for different folks. Some people don't – not as active. It, it, not, or at least it, not a punishment. You can't punish these people, but the remedy is building up conversation in your league – we, we bring up that one of the most important things for your league is an actual communication hub and a communication hub where people go regularly. Are you in the Facebook generation? Make a Facebook group. Are you in the Twitter generation? Make a Twitter DM group that every, you know that people are going to log into it once a day and they'll see the notification. So that, that would be my advice. That's how you try and remedy that is get everyone talking. Alternatively, tasers. <laughs> That is another option. That is just, I mean, you got to have complete league buy-in from all parties. But if you don't respond, you get tasered. Yeah, that, that's something that you've experimented with. <laughs> uh, no, the other, just to piggyback, Mike, you can also one-to-one these. I mean, you want to get, a, piggyback you wanna get me. A, a trade done, talk to the person just to speak to the communication thing. It's a lot easier to send out a bunch of blind deals and be mad that people don't respond. It's harder to send a note and say, hey, do you want to do a trade? Right. I almost never offer a trade through the system. You know, just click, click, and send. I'll text the person. That makes one of us. Yeah, I, and, and I guess, I guess to be fair, you get the most trades to go through, so maybe I need to just start sending out no, shotgun people trades. No, stop, people stop listening to me. Those shotgun trades worked before I had this stupid podcast. <laughs> Let's get one more voicemail, then we'll wrap it up. Hey, guys, love the show. This is Josh from Boston. Keeper question. I can keep him forever. Do I keep James Conner or do I keep Nick Chubb? Full point PPR. Appreciate the answer. Thanks so much. Uh, Nick Chubb. James Conner. It does, the difference, Man. The, the whether you can keep him forever or not doesn't make yeah, any difference it, to me. I'm only thinking for a couple years. Man, that's I I struggled with that mightily when I was over the weekend looking at, at my dynasty rankings of, of who, who would I rather have, James Conner or Nick Chubb. And it got to the point of, off the top of my head, I can't even tell you where I landed. I think Nick Chubb's a more talented player. I won't necessarily argue so, with that. I, that leans me that direction. It's not It's not some slam dunk guarantee. I mean, Pittsburgh's had so much success with rushing leaders, D'Angelo Williams and Lev Bell, and, and, you know, they've had so much success, it's hard to bet against the guy in Pittsburgh. I just right. lean Chubb. Let me ask you this question then. Is Kareem Hunt a Cleveland Brown next year? Probably not. But there's a chance. Yeah, there's a chance. Yeah, and absolutely. If so to me, then, if there, if you feel like there's a chance that Kareem Hunt is on the same team as Nick Chubb, and if that team, uh, if they're going into the off season with both of those players on the team, it's gonna both of them are gonna be involved. This it won't be what you you're getting from Nick Chubb these first eight games where he's just gonna be a workhorse. And I believe that as long as James Conner is on the Steelers. He it will be a workhorse. The funny thing is, is if Connor is what you want him to be this year, we'll see if he plays through with his cheap contract for the next right. year. Because he'll have one one season left, but he's going to get paid uh, $758,000. My guess is if they offered James Connor the deal that they offered Le'Veon Bell, he would say, Where, you. where's my pen? I tend to agree with you. <laughs> so seems like a slightly different situation. If they want to lock Connor up, I think they'll be able to do it. We're not going to have any more running backs in the NFL. <laughs> They're just going to be all holding out. Because guess what? You don't get concussed if when you hold you, out. That's true. Yeah, but you don't get paid. Well, and that doesn't seem to important. bother anybody <laughs> at all. Um, <laughs> goodness. All right, that is it for today's episode of the show. Be sure to check out Pristine Auction. Yesterday, I signed Mike Evans' jersey, or I'm sorry, I signed Chrome Speed Mini Helmet. Oh. Went for $79. There are hundreds of daily auctions from your favorite players, teams, pop culture, pristineauction.com. Use the registration code BALLERS, and you'll get $5 off your first auction. Otherwise, we'll be back with you tomorrow. 
More sleepers, values, and news. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> we'll, we'll see you then. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.